Now, I hear all kinds of different figures on how many different races of aliens are visiting our planet, so I made this video to go over the science behind these different alien races and hopefully stimulate some interesting discussion. We'll start with a thought experiment. We're going to say that the number of different alien species visiting our planet is zero. Humans are the only thing out there. Fast forwarding a couple hundred years into the future, let us just imagine that the ban on stem cell research is lifted, as well as the ban on cloning and human genetics experiments on mutation. And let's pretend that we are scientists in this distant, distant imaginary future who have access to a massive supercomputer specifically designed and built to decode DNA and work with it to artificially engineer new organisms. DNA is a very complex programming language, which deals with too many calculations for us to perform without computers. DNA works as a blueprint for cell division to follow. It is basically a 3D map of how cells should divide to create a 3D picture of the biolog biological organism. It also contains information on protein structures and all sorts of other stuff. One of the most important findings to come out of DNA research is the discovery of stem cells. Stem cells can be harvested from embryos and used to regenerate organs and limbs. As you can imagine, the possibilities that this technology creates are endless. We could take an iguana and give it bat wings, make it larger, change a few things around, and create a living, although I don't know about fire breathing, dragon. Pretty cool, right? We could go on creating all sorts of mythical creatures, maybe open up our own zoo. But why not think of something useful we can do with this technology instead? like genetically engineered super chickens that grow more meat. We have already seen evidence of this technology being developed and used in our society today. For another example, Google spider goats. Basically, they take the gene for producing spider webs from a spider's abdomen, and they somehow transplant this gene into the milk gland of a female goat so that it produces milk with spider silk inside it, which can then be extracted and then used to make Kevlar, the lightweight bulletproof material used in SWAT and riot gear. This is how they make it. Not only is, can this be done, it's already being done. Now, the law prohibits any genetic experiments from being done on or with humans. We're going to pretend that law doesn't exist, and we're going to start genetically modifying humans to create a superhuman. We'll start by enhancing the muscle tissues and fine-tune how our joints would work in order to create increased leverage and maximize strength and agility. Although it would be impossible to make him fly or shoot laser beams from his eyes, we could give him a form of x-ray vision. Although there is no known biological organism that can see an x-ray or any other wavelength of light that can't really operate on a biological level, there are animals that can sense other frequency ranges. Pit vipers get their name not because they live inside of pits, but because they have special pits on their face near their nose and eyes that allow them to see in infrared. Any object that has heat will glow in infrared. This will shine through thin clothing and other low-density non-conductors. In the movie Solo, about a cyborg warrior that can see in infrared, they use a camouflage tarp lined with metal foil in order to hide from his sight. You'd also have to make sure that the foil wasn't touching your body, because your body heat would heat the foil up and make the foil start to glow in infrared as well. You can use aluminum tin or lead foil to block many different frequencies, which is where the stereotypical notion of the tin foil hat comes from. Although these idiots were trying to block, weren't trying to block infrared frequencies, they were trying to block ELF frequencies, or so-called mind-reading or mind-altering frequencies. What these degenerates did not realize is that a proper application of Gauss's law requires a closed conductive surface in order for the line integral form to drop to zero. Basically, you'd have to cover your entire body in tinfoil, which is even more ridiculous than wearing a hat. So next time you hear anyone call a someone a tinfoil hat wearer as an epithet or a derogatory term or whatever, you can shove this little tidbit down their throat and make them shut up. Just make them look how stupid they are for even using that word. Butterflies have ocular sensors that can see in the ultraviolet spectrum. In the world of flowers, there are even more colors than our eyes can see, colors that our minds can't even comprehend or visualize, at least until we download the butterfly genetics into our computer mainframe and recombine it with our DNA in order to produce a human with super eyes. Although, can we really still call it a human? I mean, after all, the goats at the Kevlar factory are spider goats. They're not normal goats anymore. What happens when we combine reptilian and insectoid ocular genetics with our own? These genetic alterations may be slight and produce absolutely no change in physical appearance. I mean, the spider goats still look like normal goats, even though they produce spider silk in their milk. But you would still look completely human, even though your eyesight would be superhuman. But what happens when we begin to alter our physical appearance? Even if we just change something a little bit, it won't hurt, right? I mean, certainly nobody will notice. The anti-evolutionists would certainly prefer not to. 
Why not make the eyes a little bit bigger so they can absorb more light and see better in the dark? We'll also change the iris a little bit so it can open and close faster. We'll give him a bigger head and a smarter brain, and we'll also give, we could give him chlorophyll from photoplankton in his skin so he just can sit in the sun instead of eating. And then we'll shrink the size of this guy down so we can put him in space. Uh, does anyone see where I'm going with this? Uh, something similar to an alien gray is the inevitable conclusion of such an endeavor. Of course, all these changes would happen in small incremental steps at each level producing a new species of superhuman and eventually a totally alien looking species. Now just imagine that we could send out research vessels to other planets that were teeming with alien life forms, none of them intelligent, like the likes of which you've never seen before. Uh, think of all the genetics we could harvest. Each time a research vessel returned to our home world with new genetics, it would introduce the next level of advancement in our genetics. The way space time and travel, space travel works, the faster you travel, the slower time passes inside your own reference frame. So if you left on a near light speed journey to a distant star, even though the journey took you, according to your clock, 30 years to make, you would return to the home world several thousand years in the future. And by that time, your family would be gone, your genetics would be completely outdated, and the world entirely as you once knew it would be completely and forever changed. So when I hear people like Disclosure Project witness Clifford Stone say that our military has cataloged 57 different alien species, we can only wonder how many of them came from the same home world from different time periods, or and how many of them evolved on entirely different worlds from entirely different species. Which brings us to our last and final subject, reptilians. Now, I don't like rep the reptilian subject because I think it detracts from the more serious issue of the New World Order, which is, in reality, a conglomerate of banking, religious, and governmental institutions and the businesses that depend on them. Many of the people involved in the New World Order aren't necessarily tied into the conspiracy for global hegemony. Many of them are simply looking out for their best interests, and they happen to value money over human life. This is how influential businessmen and politicians are manipulated. The public is manipulated through the mass media. So when the BBC creates a propaganda hit piece trying to debunk the New World Order conspiracy, and they spend half of it talking about shape-shifting reptilians, and none of it talking about things like the Lisbon Treaty, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, the North American Union, NAFTA, the SPP, the Euro, the Amero, the RFID chip technology, etc., etc., I think it's pretty safe to assume that you know, what's real and what's disinformation. So after a long and arduous debate with a friend of mine who studies neuropsychology at Harvard to see if we could debunk this whole reptilian and insectoid thing by proving that their neurology wasn't suited for intelligence, we decided that it was still possible, but very unlikely. Reptiles and insects seem so mechanical, devoid of any thought or emotion. We decided that this was related to the fact that they have fewer brain chemicals and thus less complex interneural communication. The way that their brain cells talk to each other is much simpler than ours. Many of our memories are directly attached to emotions. Emotions is just as our, is, motion is just an expression of ke brain chemicals being released. And if you attach a memory to that brain chemical, any time it is released, you'll automatically think of that thing. Meditation is a process that you can use to shut down the production of these brain chemicals by focusing on nothing, clearing your head and calming your mind, allowing the chemicals to settle out. A reptilian or insect brain would not have such complex emotions, and they would not have such complex brains. They would only have basic emotions. And though there is no way to tell if this lack of complex emotions would affect the ability to muster complex thoughts, I still remain skeptical. In my opinion, it is the complexity of our emotionally constructed thought patterns and multiple personalities that give us our heightened sense of being, what some would call the soul, how we feel. Although its existence and manifestation is difficult to get people to agree on, we can agree that reptilians and insectoids do not have souls, which would presumably also prohibit them from having a heightened sense of being. Also, they are both cold-blooded, which doesn't really work well for interstellar space travel, except for that frogs are amphibious and, and they're cold-blooded, and there's a certain type of frog that can be frozen in ice and then thawed out and brought back to life. But this is due to an antifreeze component inside their blood, which prevents or alters crystallization of water molecules so they don't puncture cell walls, destroying the cells when they freeze. While cryobiological genetics engineering is still an emerging field of science, we have much more scientific reasons to believe in these so-called greys than we do the reptilian or insectoid aliens. And in a movement that is supposed to be about getting people to open their minds and creating a paradigm shift in human consciousness, 
Telling people that shape-shifting reptilian humanoids are trying to take over the world doesn't exactly make them want to listen to whatever else you might have to say. If you like this video and enjoy learning and talking about these kinds of subjects, don't forget to rate 5 stars and subscribe to my channel.